This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 380 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, EcoVet, and Total Saddle Fit. Tonight, we chat with Rio Olympic steward Lisa Goretto, and to honor the HRN Year of the Listener, we talk with listener Rhonda Crabtree. Reese and I will cover a listener question about how to make square halts. And don't forget, I get to chat with Karen Isberg from Kentucky Performance Products about your horse's digestive health. This is Reese Goffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood in Ontario, and you're listening to Dressage Radio Show, which we are recording very early for next <laughs> week because Glenn and, and Jen are off to Colorado or something, and they're making us work really hard tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. They're cracking the whip on us. There's some whip cracking tonight. <laughs> yeah, this has been a marathon recording session, but Bob... Golly, it's been fun listening to all these great interviews. And uh, you are correct. We are going to Colorado for vacation. So we're recording lots and lots of really fun, interesting new content to put up on all of the shows while we're away so folks don't have to suffer with reruns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank us for no reruns, right? Yeah. Yes, no reruns. Yes, we did, we like we will not do that on our show. No way. Well, but no, it's, not it's, a lot it's, anyway. <laughs> we try not to. Uh, but Jen, there's a listener meetup, right? There is a listener meetup. Well, while we are out in Colorado, we're going to have a listener meetup at the Colorado Horse Park. And that's going to happen on September the 17th. There's a three-day event going on that weekend. And it's going to be cross-country day. So will, there will be lots of fun jumping to watch. And you, everybody is encouraged to come on out and join Glenn and I and some other of the HRN hosts. And we are going to be at the Family Festival area and the Pony Rides. So meet nice. us at 11 a.m. on September 17th at the Pony Rides for the HRN Meetup. Fantastic. Sounds these, like These meetups are getting bigger and bigger, aren't they? Yes! Yes, each time we get more and more people. It's very exciting. Very fun. <laughs> well, we're, gonna, we're bummed we're missing this one, but we will make one this winter in Florida for sure. Sooner or later, you've got to come to one of our meetups. I know. We will. We promise. We promise. I think for sure. I think you can I think you can make the the one in Kentucky next year. Yeah, the Rolex one. Yep. Yes. For sure. One, I will right? be there. Were you already at the I I haven't been to one. You've been to the Rolex one though, right? I have. Yep. Uh, and unfortunately yeah. last last year um we, we had a, a a dear family friend's wedding, so I was out of town actually. Um but uh, You missed Rolex completely last year. Oh, I got my shopping day in. Don't worry. <laughs> 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 yep. We will make the listener meetups for sure. For sure. Well, cool. Well, Jen, have a great, safe vacation and enjoy. Uh, and Philip and I will be back, uh, for, you know, obviously for the for the rest of the month. So, uh, but right after this commercial break from EcoVet, we're going to come back with Lisa Goretta. She was um, the head steward at the Rio Olympic Games. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if your horse could enjoy a zone of repellency from pesky flies? Well, he can, with EcoVet. EcoVet is an entirely new type of fly repellent that is safe for horses and those applying it, offering a real alternative to toxic pesticides like pyrethrins. EcoVet confuses an insect's normal directional ability, the bug's GPS, if you will. So if it can't locate your horse, it can't bite your horse. Dr. Wendy Ying from The Driving Radio Show has been using it in South Florida, also known as the Jurassic Park of biting insects, and she just loves it. EcoVet's active ingredients are naturally occurring food-grade fatty acids that have been clinically shown to improve the condition of horses with difficult-to-treat sweet itch problems. EcoVet is effective on mosquitoes, ticks, noceums, as well as flies. You can visit EcoVet online at eco-vet.com for more information or to order. You can find EcoVet at Dover Saddlery Stores and EcoVets on Facebook. Just search EcoVet, E-C-O-V-E-T. (laughs) 
Well, this evening, we are so privileged to have Lisa Goretta. She is the, was an FEI dressage steward at the Rio Games. She is the vice president of USDF. She's the co-chair of the USEF Technical Dressage Committee. Lisa, welcome to the program. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Well, I honestly was a huge fan. I, I've known Lisa. Lisa, you've known me since I was I was a kiddo, and I was a following really long you. Time, yes. Yeah, a really long time. And I was following you on, on sort of your journey, your camping in Rio, and I, I just loved you and Robert Dover. I looked forward to your posts every day, and uh, we were talking before the show. We really don't give stewards enough love here on the Dressage Radio Show, so we are so happy that you're here with us. Well, thank you. Yes, we normally operate in the backgrounds and in the shadows, and no one sees us, although apparently I had a lot of unplanned TV time this time. Yeah, you were on TV a yeah, lot, which is really cool. <laughs> that was quite Apparent, cool. Every apparently, time. yes, apparently network TV abhors dead time or a vacuum, and so I was a space filler. You were great. We really enjoyed I was like, every time I was like, hi, Lisa, hi, Lisa. It was fun. Yeah. So, Lisa, just start us off. How did you become sort of a steward for anybody sort of looking again we don't give enough love so how do you even start to become a td and a steward well in in my case um it was an interest in the organization of horse shows so i've been a technical delegate for oh a really long time we'll say more than three decades how's that and uh, i've been an fei steward then which is kind of the same job um except for international fei licensed competitions so the you know, we're not the judges, so you don't see us um, sitting at sea. And sometimes people say good morning to us and sometimes not. But oh. we're in the background. We we help um, the organizers and the competitors. We are there to help inform, prevent, intervene. So we, we prevent problems with um, anything that is anti-level playing field in competition or anything that is against horse welfare. And we spend a lot of time educating, answering questions about rules and where you can go and where you can't go. And generally um, are charged with helping the organizers of the competition run a fair competition that follows the FEI rules. Excellent. And so how did you get picked to go to Rio? How did that happen? Well, for international events, you are... um, seriously international events you are appointed so i was appointed by the fei i got a letter from them oh last january i think that you said you've been appointed to um, officiate at the olympic games in rio and then you accept or not in my case i was very fortunate because um, the chief steward for dressage was elizabeth williams who um, is a good friend i've worked with her for a long time both as a national official and an international official Elizabeth is our FEI Steward General for Dressage for the United States, and she was selected to serve as the Chief Steward for Dressage. So it was uh, certainly an opportunity of a lifetime when she put my name in to be her assistant um, Chief Steward for the Games. So it was, you know, it, it arrived in the mail. And <laughs> I said, oh, yes. Yes, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to the Olympics. Yeah. 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 So what was it so, like when you um, arrived? No. Yeah, what happened? What was it like when you arrived? You accepted the the um, appointment, and so kind of what happened from there? You, well, you accept the appointment, and then you don't hear anything for a really long time, and you think, did I dream that? Uh, but uh, eventually, as the games got closer, then we started getting correspondence, and they ask you for things like your sizes for uniforms, and then you know that it's really going to happen. <laughs> and uh, then your airline ticket shows up and you think, OK, now I'm really going to go. And then someone says, oh, by the way, you know, are you up to date on your inoculations? And then oh. you painfully know that it's really going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that you know, and once everything is, is updated, then you get on the plane and you really don't know what's going to be happening, at least in my case. <laughs> so it, it was exciting from the time I got in the plane and Delta flew me over there. It was great. Um, once, once I arrived, I have to say that for everything that I heard about the Rio games, um, the lack of construction fulfillment and the lack of personnel, um, from the volunteer standpoint, they were very well staffed and the volunteers did everything they could possibly do from the moment you got off the plane and wondered, where do I go now? There was always someone there, um, saying, you need to go this way and you need to go that way. And here, let me help you with this. 
you need to go on this bus stand over here, which is really good because my Portuguese is less than zero. <laughs> um, so uh, from that aspect, it was terrific. And then it was about a 35 minute bus ride to where we were staying and then camp officially began. <laughs> and what was, what, what was it like where you stayed? Was it nice? Was it? Um, we were staying, well, the, the equestrian events were not in the part of Rio that you would see on the morning news programs. Um, we were in the Deodoro area, which in, is comprised um, to a large extent of a military base. So we were housed in apartments that I think probably normally are used by mid-level officers, lieutenants and captains and that sort of thing in their families. And I'm, I'm not quite sure where they were displaced to, but they were certainly <laughs> displaced. Uh, which was unfortunate, but, uh, and then the equestrian events themselves actually took place at the military base. So, um, we had no problems with security. We had yeah. <laughs> lots and lots and lots and lots of security, both at the residence and on the grounds. We would walk through two or three security checkpoints every day to get to work on the grounds. So we were very well protected there. Wow. Yeah, and I, we did even hear there was a stray bullet that was flying in the press tent, but maybe that wasn't yeah, by accident. Not sure. <laughs> no, I don't think they're actually aiming at the press, so you guys can relax. Um, <laughs> uh, it, the, the story there was there was a security blimp that had a lot of cameras, which didn't fly over, and I thought, oh, it looks like a little miniature Goodyear blimp. Um, yes. So the, the story was that someone took offense at the cameras and what the cameras might be looking at, and with a very long range rifle. So I, I don't think anyone really knew that it was going to, they, they just had poor aim. I don't think they were aiming at us. <laughs> so That's good. so I, and it? frankly, I, I found out about it on the bus one day going back to the, <laughs> to the, I didn't even know when it happened. So, <laughs> so you get there, then the horses start arriving, right? Or were they already there once you, once you got there? Uh, no, the, the stewards have to be on the grounds before the horses arrive by a couple of days. So, um, the, once they start to, to pull in and the event horses showed up first because they were the first um, division to go and then the dressage horses and then last the show jumpers. And the, the Olympics is a little different from a normal CDI where you're only working with dressage and you have a team of somewhere between four and six stewards. For the Olympic Games, um, there's a lot of sharing of expertise and labor. Uh, we had a team all together that rotated a little bit through the month, but they're generally, they're about 50 stewards. Wow. Um, some, some show jumping, some eventing, some dressage and in both Europe and South America, although it doesn't really work that way here very often, uh, there are a number of stewards who are multi-licensed in different d- disciplines. So there are some people that were there for six weeks, which wow. is a really long time down there. Yeah. So I was there uh, for three. So I arrived, um, uh, on the 29th and Elizabeth Williams arrived the day after and we had uh, three or four days before the dressage horses started to come in. I was very fortunate in the one, one night that I pulled night duty because stewarding is a 24 hour job. Horses are monitored and stabling 24 hours a day by stewards. Um, and the one night I was there, I was fortunate to have uh, about 30 dressage horses arrive. So that was an extra treat yeah. because I got to watch the whole process of, uh, the bloodstock agent bringing horses from the um, airport and getting them checked into stalls, which all we did was stay out of their way because they were extremely professional, extremely fast. They obviously really know what they're doing. Yeah. But wow. other than that, it was at three o'clock in the morning. It was great to watch. <laughs> and it kept you awake for your night duty. I would oh, yeah. <laughs> that was good. You yeah, were awake. And, you know, yeah. And the nice thing about night duty is when the stabling is closed, you the stewards get to have that little magic hour when the horses are just starting to wake up and no one's around. It's really yeah. the best time to be in the barn, especially when you're you know, walking by to make sure that the is okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's great. Without yes. waking him up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're like, hey, not waking you up. I really want a selfie. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the horses arrive. Then what happens? What's the next step? Um, once horses arrive and, and the grooms, of course, are, are there and the riders are there and there are a couple of days where the horses just get to acclimate to their area. So from, from the stewards perspective, we're monitoring stabling, um, monitoring all exercise. Anytime the horses are outside the stable, there's a steward around. Um, and this was a little new for this games for every area that horses were working, whether it was lunging or exercising or competing, 
there's not only stewards watching, but there's also a vet delegate and a farrier on hand everywhere. So anything that happened to a horse, it was instantly attended to. Wow. That's amazing. I did, I, yeah. yeah. What was, why, why were they just welfare or why did they increase yep. that? Just, yeah. It's, it's, it's strictly horse welfare. You know, it, anything that goes wrong, the, the stakes are very high when you've gotten to the Olympics and they were the, the vet team, the, the vet hospital, the inspection of the horses uh, was all just really top notch first rate. They had vets from all over the world there. They had an amazing amount of equipment. Um, so the horses were all very well cared for. That's awesome. That's great. So what happens uh, now? You were also steward for the eventing, right? Not just the dressage part. The eventing. Um, well, I was I was there during the eventing, and that's where there's a little bit of um, cross pollination of what stewards do. And the eventing stewards were, you know, out doing cross country and and really doing their thing. We were watching stabling and watching the rest of the warm up areas. But I had an opportunity to um, assist eventing by uh, supervising the the equipment check for their dressage division. Uh, the venting steward was doing it, but I was the the person who was was watching. And in most things that you do in stewarding, um, particularly at the games, the intent is to always have at least two people there. So there's always somebody there that's an extra set of eyes, or someone to help, or someone to be a witness, whatever is needed. So I was the second set of eyes for eventing, which was the first time I had my little camera ops, <laughs> and um, um, I then went on and did the equipment checking for. For dressage, there was a new little wrinkle in the FEI rules that they put in just in January that um, um, quantified what the FEI accepts as far as tightness in cabisons and also a new spot checking system that they had not used before. So I was doing that. And uh, after dressage was, was completed, I had an opportunity to help show jumping with their horse inspection. So I got to do a little bit of everything more than I would normally do at a, at a competition. And so that was a lot of fun. You get to kind of see how the other half lives. Yeah. And for our stewarding team, it was certainly interesting because we had stewards from all over the world, some who had a lot of um, experience in European championships and some um, who are perhaps a little newer to stewarding in in South America, but also some very experienced stewards from South America and Mexico. And it was interesting to see. We also had stewards from uh, Peru who will be hosting the next Pan American Games. So they were there taking a lot of notes. And we also had steward representatives from, from uh, Japan who was doing the same thing for Tokyo 2020. Wow. Yeah, you don't even think about it, but but the games will go on. They'll, there's the next set, and you got to train yeah. the next group. Yeah, you got to be prepared, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So that was that was really um, the most interesting thing. When in addition to interacting, of course, with all the grooms and riders and and the wonderful horses, was to learn a little bit more about the international culture of of equestrian sports. Um, everyone does big things the same, but it's the little things that make up the fabric. That, that it's different country to country and continent to continent. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So what was it like to work with riders like that? I think everyone always wants to know that. What what are the riders like? Um, I found the relationship between the riders and the grooms and the chef to keep um, to be very positive always. It was it was really a very um, positive experience all the way around. I don't know if it's always that way, but it was certainly that way for the Rio games from, from the organization, from the stewarding end, you have an overall chief steward who is in charge of everything. Um, and then you have each discipline steward below that. You then have teams of stewards. So each day there might be three or four team leaders who have to assign their groups into it. So it's, it's a lot of, um, administration and, in that administration, you end up seeing different portions of the competition. One day you might be in stabling, the next day you might be in general warm up. So you have event horses and show jumping horses and dressage horses, fortunately all flatting, um, no jumping <laughs> at the same time. Um, but everyone was really great to work with. The language barrier was certainly present. I had a little um, extra ticket on my credentials that said I speak English. Um, so that was, you know, that was important. We always had to have it at certain key positions, like the entrance to stabling. We had to make sure that that could handle not only the official language of the FEI, which is 
English first and French second, but that we had plenty of people who could understand Portuguese. And, you know, then all of a sudden you have somebody who was really primarily speaking Russian, but they had a little English. And so, it's, you know, you spend a lot of time trying to work your way through the communication, but that, that made for a, a better experience. I think everybody was really very positive. I didn't run into really a, a cranky person or a bad mood, um, you know, unless you know, for a short period of time, if their schooling didn't go the way they wanted or their, their ride didn't go the way they wanted, but everybody was, was amazingly professional. Fantastic. Well, it just sounds like an amazing experience, and I hope that this uh, kind of ignites someone who is interested in being coming uh, a technical delegate or steward to to go on in that path because it really is a cool path, and we need more uh, TDs and stewards yes. out there. Yes, yes, we do. Um, if if you're interested, I I could never, you know, as much as I love horses and I love horse shows, I could never judge because I could never sit that long in one place. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm a better better mover arounder, and that's that's part of the reason that um, technical delegate and stewarding is a better job for me. And you know, you, you do have to kind of be detail oriented because there are there are rules in whatever sport you're in, uh, but it's it's an opportunity to stay in horse sports and around horse sports um whether or not i have time or or resources to compete i'm still around the sport that i love so that's that's a great opportunity that's great well lisa thank you so much for telling us about rio it looked like you had just an experience of a lifetime and uh, we look forward to talking with you after the tokyo games Oh, well, maybe we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. That would, that would be interesting. That, yeah. that would be interesting. It would be a whole different culture and a whole different cuisine. Yeah, so. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank so, you. Thanks Lisa. so much. Well, today for the Year of the Listener, we are super happy to have Rhonda Crabtree on. She did a wonderful clinic with uh, Canadian judge and trainer and writer, Cara Whittem. Welcome to the show, Rhonda. Hi, thanks for having me. We are super excited to have you tonight and, and can't wait to hear. Tell us a little bit about your horse and what it was like to go to the clinic. Well, my horse is a 17-year-old uh, Canadian warm blood. Um, he is third level, and I am third level. And um, his name is Obi. Obsession is his show name. <laughs> Love it. Um, but we stuck with Obi because my husband loves Star Wars, so. <laughs> kinda, kinda, Whatever kinda it takes. Obi-Wan connection. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> you know what, Reese? <laughs> yes, whatever, whatever makes hubby's happy, we're, we're on it. It's great. So, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and so what what kind of stuff, sorry, what kind of stuff were you working on sort of going into this clinic and, and what, what were maybe some of your trouble spots and, and, and things about your training that you've been working on? Well, just about two weeks before, I actually did two clinics with her and about two weeks before the first clinic, I finally got my changes so that I could do them. He wasn't fucking anymore. And I went in the clinic and we did kind of a warm up of this, that, and the other. And she said, okay, change, you know, right to left and then left to right. And we just did them. And she had no idea that two weeks ago I couldn't have done that. So that was pretty cool. And so then she said, oh, your, your changes are really good. And she made me work on counter canter. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the way? So of course, then she found the, the uh, tricky spots in that and worked through them with me. And, um, yeah, it was really great. She was what was, what was, sorry, what was the format? Of, because I know that Kara does a lot of clinics in which you ride a test in front of her. Was, was it that, or was it just, uh, a normal no, student was, instructor sort of situation? Yeah. Yeah. More like just a regular lesson. And it was amazing though, cause she'd been watching me ride for about three minutes in total. And she had me and my horse figured out completely. <laughs> No, that's fantastic, though. That's great. Yeah. She just knew exactly where our weak spots were and, and, you know, that he was stiff to the right and all of this stuff. She just knew instantly. It was amazing. Can you give us maybe um, an exercise or two, like in, in the counter canter? What was the pattern that she had you ride that, to help really improve that? Well, she had me um, just change the rein and stay in counter canter. And of course he kept 
changing. <laughs> she worked <laughs> on that so hard. And then the biggest thing was she had me, don't get frustrated, just try it again. And there was, she's, she actually said he wants you to get frustrated because then you'll stop focusing and you will stop asking for it. So she said, with it, with an older horse like that, that's kind of like a school horse, just, you just have to keep trying until he says, oh, she's not going to get frustrated. I might as well do it. So. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's, that's a lot of horses kind of try and get you to be a little bit emotional about the, about the riding. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, then you sort of stop riding the horse, you start riding your emotion. And that's always a bad idea because it's only going to get worse, right? I mean, yeah, you know, sometimes I have riders just, you know, take a breather, take a moment, get away from the exercise for a moment if that's a, you know, if it's a point of contention because uh, you, you can't, you know, you can't ride it tougher or ride it better by, by um, you know, being a little mad or frustrated or, or you know. What, what, what do you think, Reese? No, I think you're totally right. I think sometimes just to stop, take a deep breath, think about it, make sure your aids are really clear. I think that's always, and and that's normal when you're working really hard on flying changes and then you go back to counter canner. Uh, I think that's a, that's a completely normal um, thing. And, and I think just stopping and, and taking a deep breath and seeing where you are is, is a good thing always. And um, whenever you're frustrated, sometimes it's good just to stop and take a deep breath. It's funny because the horse is like, look how good I can be. I do yeah. all these fun changes. And you're like, yeah. no. No. You no, know, that can be the, the most frustrating thing coming into a lesson or a ride in which you're, you know, you've been working on one thing. And then I think that's classic about the changes and the counter canter. It's like, look how well I can do the changes. And then all of a sudden it's like, now can you ride counter canter again? And then you're like, no, no. it's I don't want to go backwards. <laughs> I want to go forwards. You know, I want to do forward. more changes. I want to yeah. do threes and twos and ones. And, you know, why can't we just do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's just going back and just rebalancing. But that's what's nice about clinicians is they get a snapshot. Uh, you know, of course, they they listen to, I'm sure, what you did in the past. But, you know, they get a snapshot of what you are doing today. And I think that's what's so good about going to a clinic is your trainer and, and you, you know, typically everybody gets in a routine. But then when you go to someone different, you know, maybe it changes things a little. And that's a good thing. So, I love it. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, she really didn't see any, say anything new from what I have with my regular coach, but just a different way of saying it and very, very encouraging. And then when I went back for the second clinic, she was actually, she seemed really impressed with how much we'd improved. And it was kind of a, the first clinic was kind of a jumping off point with, okay, we can do this, now let's improve it. And then by the second one, I was riding like everything in the canter a lot better. Like, you know, when I ask for Traver, I get Traver and, you know, all those things that can be tricky. Oh, good. Fantastic. No, that's very, very good. Well, Rhonda, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us and telling us what it was like to go to a to a clinic and 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 do that. That's fantastic. So we look forward to watching your uh, progress as you go through. Thanks so much. And I am so glad that I get to do this month's supplement tip with Karen Isberg from Kentucky Performance Products because Philip and Reese are busy out doing something probably on board a horse. So welcome to the Dressage Radio Show, Karen. Hey, thank you, Jen. It's fun to be able to talk to you today. Yay, I get to pick your brain. (laughs) My turn, my turn, my turn. (laughs) Usually I just talk to you behind the scenes and today we get to do it on the air. On the air. We have to behave though. We have to behave. (laughs) Have to behave yourselves. Well, to this we can't be too wild and crazy. Yeah, we have to keep keep it keep it keep it normal. So this yeah. time we are going to be talking about digestive health, which is a topic that every horse person obsesses over. So please help help us assuage some of our worries. Well, and it, you know, actually, it's it's not as hard to keep your horse's digestive tract healthy as you think it is. There's um. There's a couple of different strategies that you can use that are really pretty simple. So okay, let's that, break it I'm down. I'm going to break it down to just be as simple as it can be. Hey, so this, that's a pun. You. Break it down, digestive health. Break ah! it down. <laughs> Yay. We're already on a roll. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and people ask all the time, well, you know, why should I care if my horse's digestive tract is healthy? Well, you know, of course, the first thing is that it's, it allows the horse to 
um, absorb all of the nutrients from his feed, which is very important for two reasons. One, his health, and two, for your pocketbook. Uh, you know, you don't want to have to feed any more feed than, than you need to. So if his, health, if his digestive tract is healthy, then he's absorbing more nutrients. And also it reduces the risk of um, the three things that we all dread, which is colic, diarrhea, and ulcers. And it does that by protecting the gut from um, having imbalances, mostly imbalances in the pH level, which is the acid base level of the gut. So you want the pH to be balanced, and then that helps the microbes in the microbiome to stay healthy. And all of those things then contribute to, actually contribute to a very robust immune system. So all the way around, you're helping your horse just be more healthy if he has a healthy digestive tract. Well, that makes perfect sense. So he's absorbing calories as well as nutrients because, as we know, they don't necessarily go together, right? Exactly. Energy and nutrients. Energy and nutrients. Now, when it comes to his digestive health, it's what you put in as well as how much you put in. Am I right? Exactly. So we've, yep. we've got... So this, this, go ahead. We've got quality versus quantity. So you can pour a whole lot of um, nasty, cheap junk food in there, or you can put in there high-quality ingredients and give him um, the human version of a really good quality diet, like a, a person would eat good quality ingredients. Is, so is that kind of how – is that one of the strategies, is quality versus quantity? That's definitely one of the strategies, is, is quality versus quantity. And, of course, a lot of that depends on the type of horse you have and what you're doing with them. So, you know, we all struggle with that easy keeper who lives, um, you know, looks at a bale of hay and gains 50 pounds. And then we also have the opposite end of the spectrum where we have the horse that you can feed 50 bales, bales of hay to and won't gain any weight. So you have to balance the, the, two, the two out. Um, the the best strategy for keeping a healthy digestive tract is to feed adequate fiber. So you want your horse to eat one and a half to two percent of their body weight per day in fiber. And the fiber can come from multiple sources. It can come from hay, which most people feed. It can come from the pasture. It can come from hay cubes or pellets. And it can also come from something called super fibers, which are very easily fermentable fibers. They have a small amount of lignin in them, so they're very easily fermented and digested, and those would be beet pulp and soy hulls. And people are seeing a lot of those in their concentrates these days. Soy hulls. Interesting. I'm not as familiar with soy hulls as I am beet pulp. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. So those are the two. So, you know, um, one and a half to two pound, two percent of the horse's body weight would be, for a thousand pound horse, 15 to 20 pounds of hay a day. And I tell you, my horse can put down 20 pounds of hay in a heartbeat. Yeah. 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 And my horse, who's 1,300 pounds, he eats between 19 and 26 pounds of hay a day. Wow. And he, can, he, and he has no problem putting that away. Wow. He, I, th I think, I think many of us underestimate just how much hay our horses would like to consume. Because we give them enough hay that, okay, it's all cleaned up because I don't want to waste it because the doggone stuff's expensive, right? And we, we don't want to have to sift it out of their stall when we're cleaning. I think we underestimate that pretty frequently in that if there's if there's a little bit of hay left over in the stall, we assume the horse didn't want to eat it when, in fact, he wanted to eat it, but he was fussy and didn't want to eat it after he'd stomped all over it. Yeah, I mean, and that's important, too, is to feed your hay in a, in a way that it, you keep it clean. So, you know, if you have an easy keeper and, you know, you you would go on that low end of of the body weight percent, so you'd feed 1.5%, you might put it in a slow feeding uh, hay net. Those things are fantastic. It really slows the horse down. You want the horse to be eating fiber 24 hours a day, if at all possible. So the longer you can make it last, the better, because as they chew, they produce saliva, and saliva is a natural buffer for the gut. So as they chew and they swallow, they're buffering their stomach and buffering their stomach. And, of course, that's how they would do it in nature if they were out grazing. They would constantly be buffering their stomach. And when we put them in stalls and we feed them meals, we take away that natural buffering capacity, and that's when you have trouble with ulcers. Aha. Uh -huh. So strategy one, quality versus quantity, and get that right amount of fiber to your horse. Get the appropriate amounts. What's strategy number two? 
And and keep feeding it all the time. All well, the time. and the other thing, just a quick tip for people that, that often ask me, horses that are out on pasture, you know, how do you figure out how much they're eating? Um, the point. Uh, the research that has been done, if you have a horse out on lush pasture, your horse eats about the equivalent of one pound of hay per hour. So that gives you some idea. If your horse is out for 12 hours a day on good pasture, he can eat about 12 pounds. Interesting. And if we... If you think about the math there, because when I first read that statistic, I went, wait a minute, he's eating a lot more than that. When they're looking at equivalent hay, so if you were to take the amount of grass your horse eats in an hour and magically remove it from his insides and put it in a big pile, it would look it would be a much larger pile by volume than that one pound of hay would because the hay's had the moisture sucked out of it. So by volume, your horse's tummy wants way more than a pound of hay an hour because he he's consuming it in volume he's not consuming it by the pound he doesn't measure it by the pound he just stuffs it in his face until his tummy feels a little bit full <laughs> so i can well, as it moves through that huge digest, digestive tract it's broken down so and if they're eating consistently then it's broken down consistently and the nutrients are released consistently and it 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 just it just keeps everything really yeah. working well it makes so, so it's much better for more them sense. to have it over a period of time yeah there we go excellent yep yep so that's strategy number 1 feed good hay or fiber of some kind and feed plenty of it, feed enough of it so that your horse is getting, like I said, one and a half to 2% of their body weight per day. You never want to go below 1%. There we go. Horses that are eating less than 1% of their body weight in hay are going to start to have trouble with their digestive tract because it just does not support the microbiome the way we need to, and that's when you start having colic and diarrhea and all kinds of, of issues. There we go. Um, the second strategy is small, frequent concentrate meals and by concentrates i mean pellets or sweet feeds or that that fortified product or plain grain that you add to your horse's diet mostly to add energy and to add vitamins and minerals so that you want to do that you never want to feed more than four to five pounds in any particular meal Um, and you want to have a diet that is lower in starch and sugar now all horses need a certain amount of starch and sugar. Horses need a certain amount of glucose readily available to fuel work. They just don't need large amounts of it. And the reason why is because horses have a limited quantity of the enzyme amylase. And amylase breaks down starch and sugar. So if you feed your horse more starch and sugar than they have amylase to break it down, then it, we call it, it escapes into the hindgut. And there's, you know, a certain amount of uh, microbes in the hindgut, a certain amount of bugs, and there's a a balance of those bugs. And if the sugar and starch goes in, then the bacteria that ferment sugar and starch go crazy. They go, oh, we're having a party, we have all this food, and they just start fermenting away. And they produce a byproduct called lactic acid, which then lowers the pH in the gut, makes it more acid. Of course, those bacteria love that acid environment, so they're even happier. But the good bacteria hate it, and they start to die off. And as the good bacteria die off, they produce toxins, endotoxins, that are released in the gut. And because the pH is dropping and it's more acidic, it irritates the lining of the hindgut, which then allows for these toxins to get into the bloodstream, and that's what causes your horse to get laminitis. And you have that cascading effect, and before you know it, you've got a big headache and a big vet bill on your hands. It's a vicious cycle. So it's really important to always feed small amounts of starch and sugar at a time. So if you have a horse that's a really hard keeper, feed him four times a day. Instead of feeding him two big meals, yeah, and it you may know, it may well be lunch, uh, dinner and late yeah. night. It well, it may be, well be worth the investment to get one of those automated feeders, so that at eleven o'clock at night, when everything's quiet and you can't do a, a check because you live an hour and a half from the barn, you can have right. it set to give him another small meal. Right, it dumps it in there, yeah. and you can also use them. I and we've talked about this before on the Dressage Radio Show, but you can use if calories are an issue, you can feed fat supplements instead that of that increase the calories yeah, without yeah. putting the starch in sugar in, instead in. So of the volume of starch yeah. for that yeah 
So the, the two things to remember is good fiber, lots of it, and small, frequent, concentrate meals. There we go. That's cool. Yeah. And when you have a horse that, you know, I mean, like my horse is shipping all the time and, and going to horse shows and, you know, his, his routine is changing constantly, or if you have a horse that's high strung, doesn't handle change well, then that would be a good time to put them, or, or has had problems in the past, that would be a good time to put them on a digestive aid like Nalox Advanced. Because that just get, takes what Mother Nature should be doing for his tummy and helps it along. It, it's exactly what it does. So it has the gastric buffers and coating agents in it. So it keeps the pH in the stomach where it needs to be. And then it coats the sensitive lining so that when the acid does wash up, it doesn't harm it. Then it has a, uh, an ingredient called Saccharomyces boulardii. I love that name. <laughs> Just something you want to put on a T-shirt just for fun. Yeah, you know, or S, we call it S-Bilardii for short when, you know, we don't want to pronounce the whole thing. But that is actually a probiotic. So um, the difference, you'll hear the term probiotic and prebiotic used a lot. So probiotics actually impart nutrients to the horse and to the microbial population, whereas prebiotics really only support the microbial population. Now that is the most concise and sensible way anybody has ever explained that. Say that again. (laughs) Okay, so a probiotic, it imparts nourishment to the horse as well as the bugs, and the prebiotic imparts nourishment to the bugs. Dang. Why have I, where's that explanation been for the past 25 years? (laughs) I don't know. I say it every day, so I I talk about it a lot. (laughs) That's my takeaway right there. The difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic, the probiotic imparts nutrients to the horse as well as the little good bugs in there. And the prebiotic just feeds the bugs, the good bugs. Basically, yeah. And the difference between the two is the probiotic remains viable through the entire system. And a prebiotic will oftentimes be damaged by the acids in the stomach. So So it is no longer really able to impart benefit to the horse itself. But when it gets down into the hindgut, the bugs can then ferment it and digest it and use those, those the benefits there. So, so that's basically the difference. So the, the Espelardii is a true probiotic. It remains viable through the entire system, and it imparts nutrients all the way down the track. Which sounds so, to me like it's a much better option than one that only works partway. It's, I think you need to have a balance of, of everything. Mm-hmm. Is But it's, it's definitely... Um, you, you want to have a, some kind of a probiotic, and, and the Espelardii is the best one out there. It's had a lot of research done on it. One thing that it does do, which is nice, is it increases the digestion of the starch and sugars in the small intestine. And that's a good thing. By supporting the tissues there, that's which is thing. a very good thing. Yes. And it also accelerates the healing of um, stomach and colonic ulcers because it, it increases the tissue turnover. So it helps the tissues heal faster as it goes through. So it's good. It reduces, um, it, you know, imbalances that cause diarrhea, and it also helps the colonic and gastric ulcers to heal. So it's a good, it's a good ingredient. There we it's go. It's something you want to see. And then we also have something called fermentation metabolites in Nalox Advanced. And they mostly work on the hindgut. Well, they actually, they actually impart um, nutrients through the entire gut, um, they stimulate the immune response. They help reduce inflammation. They produce or, or they add some antioxidants into the gut, which, of course, are always helpful um, to protect the cell membranes up throughout the body um, to help you recover after exercise and things. And then, of course, they also um, support the growth and activity of the beneficial bacteria. So the combination of you kind of got a three-prong approach there to digestive health. There you go. Three prongs, three easy to take care of prongs. You feed an appropriate amount amount of good quality fiber and you, what was the second one? The second one was feed small meals frequently. And the third one is for horses who have had previous issues or have their, their uh, routines changed or are under uh, amounts of stress. You should use a good quality uh, digestive support product like Nalox Advanced. 
Yeah. I got it. I win. I get an A and a gold star. Perfect. (laughs) We boiled it down, haven't we? Yes. So thank you very much, Karen. And for folks who have even more question marks floating around above their head, how can they contact the good folks at KPPU at at Kentucky Performance Products? Well, they can go to our website, kppusa.com, and they can search our tips and topics blog. There's tons of articles on there. About and it's everything. a very good search engine you guys have. It, it's very oh, thorough. It's frustrating when you go to a website and you hit the search button and nothing comes up and you know it's in there. You guys have a really good search. A lot comes up. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's not all exactly what you're looking for, but keep looking and you'll find it. It's in there. Um, you can call us uh, during our office hours, which are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and you can call us at um, 859 859- Eight seven three two nine seven four, and we're always here to answer questions about the products if you have them. We're always here to do that. And then you can also contact us on Facebook. So I look at the Facebook page pretty much seven days a week. So if you leave a message there, somebody will get back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much again for stopping by the Dressage Radio Show with your supplement segment. Thanks for having me, and I hope everybody has a good ride today. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, Phil, we've got a listener question for the Total Saddle Fit tip of the week, don't we? Well, I think I don't even have to intro this one too much because I think it's pretty straightforward. The the listener was asking how to make her horse halt square and I think this is a really important tip because there's two halts to every test and right from the beginning in training level, um, you've got a halt. So I think the first thing to talk about is that actually, you know, uh, the halt should be, the demand of the halt is different from training level as you move up through training first, second, I mean, and we can include the intro test as well into that, that, you know, when, when you do a halt in intro or training, um, the squareness is maybe not a priority as long as the horse halts in balance and you can halt through the walk in the first, you know, in those first tests. And then, you know, you move up through the levels and eventually you're cantering to, down the center line to do a halt. So um, it depends on what level you're at that you're, that demand of the halt is, is a little different. But uh, in general, we want to train the horse right from the beginning to learn to halt square. So saying that, what, how, do you, how do you do it, Reese? How, how are you um, yeah, no, trying it, this to happen? It, it, it's a good question. And I think some horses, it comes a little bit more naturally to you than others. You know, the, the more balanced horses um, are going to have a little bit easier time. Um, you know, like you said, Phil, I always start through the walk. You know, I may be trotting and then I go through the walk so that I have a little bit more balance going into the halt. Um, I will tell you, I, I have a horse right now, Marcus, our, um, our resident uh, Andalusian Poor Marcus cannot, he's finally getting halting square, but he really (laughs) struggled with it. He's kind of like conformed like a couch. So I'm not sure why it's so hard for him, but he really struggles with halting square. Um, So one of the things that I always tell people, it's a lot of practice. And when you practice halts, whenever you're doing halts, we always do square halts period. So we teach them from the very beginning from when they're little that um, when we halt, they, they halt square. Uh, I think a lot of times you'll find that one leg is back more than the other. Uh, And I think as you're going through your halts, you really have to sort of diagnose, like, why is that happening? I think a lot of times it's kind of an image or a mirror image of what's happening in the contact. It gets a little bit more complicated. So you have to kind of feel like what is happening and is the horse truly connected um, through your seat and your leg to both hands. Both so, reins, yeah, that's the biggest mm-hmm. thing. You know, that has yep. it's it's really related to the straightness of the horse yep. and the horse's ability to push equally with uh, with both both back back legs. Exactly. So I think you have to be really careful to 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 diagnose and watch uh, and pay attention to your halts at all times. Um, I had a, a dear student of mine many years ago. I was a young young trainer, and she said it. She said, "Well, why why aren't you practicing square halts?" And from then on, I never didn't not practice the square halt. Um, and so sometimes it does take a little bit of time to go back and correct the horse a little bit. Um, but I think it it is pr- part of practice. And like Phil said, you have at least two scores in each test, and 
a lot of times more than two scores, three scores. Um, in the lower levels, you'll have an extra halt and a rain back or a halt. Uh, yeah, so there's a halt can, uh, in first test three. There's one in the middle mm-hmm. of the test. And yep. then in second level, you have to do your halt rain back and all the way up to, you know, the Grand Prix, which we talked about, um, has a halt rain back in it. So it's worth practicing, right? Yeah, it's worth practicing it and getting it right from the beginning. This is one of those things that if you do it from the beginning, it just becomes habit. And if you wait and then you don't practice it or don't, or you're not a little bit detail oriented on that one, uh, it will come back later and you'll have to, you have to deal with that. So that's how we do it, Phil. How about anything to add? Uh, yeah, maybe a couple of things. Um, to get the halt square, you have to ride a lot of energy into it. So if if the horse is not pushing uh, into the both reins, into both hands, um, and they're sort of slowing into the halt a little bit, then they will not halt square. Um, <clears throat> once you've made the halt, it's really hard to correct it to make it square after the halt mm-hmm. is, you know, after the horse has stopped. Um, you know, one thing I want to say is that never step the horse back to make the halt square. Um, you know, the horses that have a little trouble with it, you, you have to actually learn to, um, make a half step forward because Mm -hmm. if you make a whole step, they're going to have the other back leg out the back. So, um, you can carefully sort of try and push the hind legs so they make a half step so that both hind legs meet each other. And then, and then you can, you know, hopefully stop and reward the horse a lot, give a lot of sugar. You know, if you have a horse that has a little trouble in it, um, also it's not important to halt. For 10 minutes, once they've squared up, you know, halt, you know, have a, a moment of immobility and then, you know, go forward and, and move on from it. Because, you know, sometimes if you hold the horse in the halt, um, they have to be active to be halting correctly and square. So if the horse is there and they're working and then, you know, they just can't hold it for very long, that's not really an important factor. You know, teach them to halt square, give them a pat and then go on to something else. Um, other things, you know, some horses are nervous about halting, so don't do a million of them every day, do a few good ones every day and then move on to something else or come back to it a little bit after doing another exercise. Um, you know, all, you know, these little things, um, to help, to help you. I think in general, it's just that people don't ride enough energy into the halt. And so the horse is sort of stopping without pushing into the halt. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Pushing into the stop, and and that's where you get the legs sort of separated. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah, one of the hardest things right. to do, but it's yeah. sort of like once you get the knack of it, it's like it's, you never learn easy. how to undo it. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. just uh, just patient practice. You know, as with most things, it's a lot of patient practicing. Um, the I think the listener asked if you can do it from the ground. I really don't think mm, that you yeah, can do that. Yeah. I, it's not are. necessarily. Uh, yeah, it's not necessarily a a trick. Like you know, like you know, walking the horse or lunging the horse and and halting square. I, I personally, when I'm lunging the horses, I don't think I've ever had one where I can get them to halt square halt. from the lunge. No, because it's a ba- it's a seat balance thing. So mm-hmm. I, you know, so I've never really tried to do that. I know everybody's got their own system, their own program, and and uh, you know, sort of what works for you works for you, sort of thing. But um, no. those are my no, tips. Agree. I think. That's yeah, no, I help. like it. We're going to talk about the new girth that uh, Justin has. And Phil and I have both tried this girth, and it's fantastic. So, Phil, take it away. I've had it. It's called, uh, for quite a bit, it's called the Stretch Tech Shoulder Relief Girth. It has all the same awesome qualities and features of the shoulder relief girth, only that this one has a triangular elastic center that um, that allows the horse's chest to expand and uh, it makes a softer contact with the horse's sternum. So, it's it's taken all the qualities of that nice shoulder relief girth and enhanced them even further and uh, made an awesome girth to allow your horse to breathe a little better. Um, it fits awesome. It, you know, it allows the, sh- the shoulder freedom that we've talked about, puts your saddle in the exact right place where you want it to stay. I like to test things out to see if they, you know, mm-hmm. stand up to the rigorous training schedule, work schedule of, of the horses that we have. And I've used it almost every day and it's it's been a really great growth. I think it's even better than the shoulder relief growth um, because it's got it's got more liners. You can you have options. You know what you want mm-hmm. to be on the, against the horse. So I have the the leather one, and what I've really been liking is the the neo, neoprene liner, which yes. is easy. You can take it off, hose it down, or put it in the wash or whatever, and it's been extremely durable and it fit forms to the horse. Good job, Phil. 
and, if there's and anything else specific, yeah. any specific question about halting or, or somebody wants to send a video of a horse to us, we can always evaluate that sort of thing and talk about it on air. Um, we love email and Facebook shout outs. Yeah. It's our favorite We love favorite all that thing. great stuff to help us, you know, get, get the understanding of the training better out to our listeners, you know, and that only can happen through, through questions and ideas and discussion. Yeah, we love it. Well, as always, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com, and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. The best way to get in contact with me or, or to see what I'm up to is through Facebook, and my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week for allowing us to put on a good show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. 